And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us from over the international dateline. <laughs> Because we hate time zones here, I have a whole book. I have a whole book on the Book of Grudges dedicated to time zones. And a, a, a man who's form, who formerly has his, has of his claim to fame, creatures of the near kingdoms, Lorn and Lorne Sound of the Bachelor. And and is and is now working on a system neutral campaign campaign in the form of Reach of the Roach God. The one, the one man who probably hates roaches about as about as much as I about as much as I hate time zones, the one and only ZXU. How you doing today, man? Oh, today Hi, for uh, me. Today for you. Uh, yep. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to start out as I as I often do in these things with the humble beginnings in a sort. Um. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Right. Uh, so, I'm. So I I live in a small town called Potics in Malaysia, uh, in in Malaysia, yeah. which is in Southeast Asia, and uh, I am by trade a sort of writer. I used to I used to be a journalist, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so yeah, I was I was primarily a culture writer, and uh, I didn't start playing games until quite like typically the folks I speak to tend to say that they start playing in in school or in college, but I never I never played until like so my my entire sort of friend group was a bunch of like sort of working people. And so I first started playing games when fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons came out, mm -hmm. uh, because one of my friends said, Hey, you know, like there's this game called Dungeons and Dragons. I used to play it in university. It's got a new edition out. Do you, anyone want to try? And because we were all part of this weekend sort of board game group, it, like it was easy for us to like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, and so that was our so my my first intro my first game ever uh but also it was the out of that group like the three of us uh the th three of the people in that group are now the people working on this on this on this new book that i'm working on which is reach of the roach uh so i think after the introduction, it was really a uh, it really sort of focused my interests in before before this I was playing board games, I was playing video games uh, and kind of uh, kind of keeping it under wraps because you know it's not it's I it used to think like it was a dirty secret mm -hmm. um, like Manka and I so Manka was the is the creator I work with for Thousand Thousand Islands, which is the wider project under which our Kickstarter is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's he's a visual artist, and so both the both of us would go to like sort of art exhibition openings and like uh, sort of say, hey, hey, you know, like uh, we we were kind of like in the same sort of social circles, but it would be like I I sort of figured out that he he went to sort of cyber cafes to play like video games. And it's like, hey, we we have a dirty secret. We know about each other, um, so we we sort of bonded over that thing. Um, eventually, but eventually, it's it sort of progressed to the point where uh, he started playing, uh, make designing card games, and because we both had a shared interest, we basically it was an opportunity for us to turn our sort of useless hobby into a work thing and therefore justify it and rationalize it to to ourselves really um yeah so 
we we designed a card game called Politico before this, uh, b before we started playing role playing games. And Politico was a card game about uh, Malaysian pa party politics. Uh, so it was it was a it was a way for us to study and mod and and model uh, the the way uh, parliamentary politics in Malaysia worked, uh, like how how politicians uh, functioned, the 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 sort of nasty things that they did to sort of gain or lose voters. Um, so yeah, that that was our first the first time we Mankau and I worked together. When we started playing fifth edition, uh, I know I went down a rabbit hole. So it was a, um, it was a. I started getting really into a lot of very quickly. Dungeons and Dragons led to Dungeon World, which led to uh, Powered by the Apocalypse sort of games which led to Burning Wheel, and I became really, really interested in all these like heavily designed, uh, like sort of clockwork machine sort of like role-playing games, which which had a mechanic to, uh, to shape sort of player behavior in the most minute of ways. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I bought all these books, I backed all these Kickstarters, and I tried to get my friends to like, out at that same gaming group to play these games and uh i couldn't because they i tell them about the book and they look at the book and they try to read it and they they go wow this is these are there are too many rules here uh it's so tightly wound i'm i need to study and internalize this book this huge sort of book to get to the fun and that so that just didn't work for our group um concurrently i was uh reading lots of like lots of blogs about sort of rpg game design and i the point where i start i realized that i wanted to do this for myself was stumbling across uh patrick stewart's blog uh false machine uh, Patrick Stewart is a creator in the sort of old school mm -hmm. renaissance sort of sub-community. Mm -hmm. And it was a particular post. It was, uh, it was a po post where Patrick was doing a read-through of a book called uh, The Art of Not Being Governed, which is a book by uh, ethnographer uh, James Scott, uh, who was writing about sort of the mountain regions of northern Southeast Asia and the sort of cultural context of that of that region. And so like he like Patrick was going through the book and sort of taking sort of bits bits of fact fact and sort of passages and sort of thinking about how what he could use in a game if he were to run a game in a in a sort of uh adventure that was inspired by this kind of geography and that was that was really eye-opening to me because one patrick's a great sort of very evocative writer with the ear for poetry uh but it was also that idea that you could make a thing with a very specific um starting point or or at least in terms of games and the sort of where gaming inspiration comes from it's it's quite a uh, idiosyncratic like who else would make a, a what would consider the the zomia region which is the region that it's that this place is called uh, material for, for for making games so yeah I, I when i discovered patrick's blog that was like the sort of catalyst for me to like hey i, I want to write these things um this I like games. I like the the poetry. I, I'm excited about the poetry that is possible uh, writing game texts. Um, yeah, so that's how that's how I started. And from those initial, th so I started blogging more about these kind of things. And from those initial blog posts, that became 
the first adventure module that I published with it, which is uh, Long, Long Song of the Bachelor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that was that was published in cooperation with Hydra Cooperative and mm -hmm. Exalted Funeral. A few years ago now, I believe. I can't really I can't recall exactly when. But... Um, it's yeah. set. It says. The uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at it right I'm looking at its um drive through RPG page, mm. um. It doesn't it says, um, November twenty ninth twenty nineteen is when it was added to right. the catalog. That, so if it was that if it was on right. another site before then I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to tell you on that because. I can do a lot so of I, things, I, but I can't. But I can only do so much. I think I wrote the initial draft of that adventure in 2017, 2018, maybe. And yeah, it was published in 2019. That sounds about right. Um, yeah. But, and it's, um, I suppose, I just, I do find I do find it kind of interesting that you gravitated to the um, to to the OS to the OSR end of things, in a way that's somewhat parallel to some of the OSR stories I hear coming out of I come coming out of Brazil these days. Right. Um, right. <clears throat> now, as I now oh. as I understand now the um a thousand. Now, with that with that in mind, um, what would what would you say would be the origin story of Reach of the Roach God itself? Right. So, uh, for the last five years, so I, I published Lonson of the Bachelor mm -hmm. in collaboration with a different sort of illustrator, uh, Nadir Noor. Uh, but when so. Sort of parallel to that, Mankao and I started talking talking about doing a project together. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he had a uh, he had a research project the, the, that he wanted to do, which were which he was calling a thousand thousand islands. Um, and it was really born out of his sort of reaction to the kind of imagery and stories that uh, were purportedly inspired by Southeast Asia, but to, in his opinion, were basically either sort of Euro fantasy or slash uh, wuxia sort of tropes, but reskinned into the sort of Kares and Tengkolo sort of styles of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it wasn't like it was a it was a it was a conceptual frustration in that um, uh, these creators, whether or not they were from the west or even from the region, had didn't have the capacity or didn't it either didn't want to or didn't have the capacity to uh, delve deeper. And sort of explore what uh, what stories could be like if they were truly informed by this geography and this particular culture and particular mouthfeel, because it didn't feel uh, it it didn't speak to him and to to us, uh, because it it didn't feel it lacked the feeling of the here. Uh, if you if you get what I mean, mm -hmm. so uh, he, so the the way he approached the thing was it was it was really it began a sort of visual exploration. So he was looking at a lot of like material culture, uh, uh, textile culture, for example, is has traditional has traditionally been hugely uh, significant in lots of lots a lot of Southeast Asian cultures. So it was mm -hmm. like um, a lot of focus to sort of material culture what tools people use and how the tools uh, shape culture. For example, in one of the zines, one of our Thousand Thousand Island zines, uh, uh, 
Macau sort of talks about the the hand uh, the hand sickle, which because the which is which is a tool that was uh, that is the way it is because of certain cultural specificities uh, in lots of uh, Southeast Asian cultures. The 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 paddy spirit is a very important aspect of uh, rice cultivation. So you a scythe, a big scythe, is seen as too uncouth. So that's why you'd have a hand sickle that you go to cut the stalks uh, individually. So that's why a tool like that exists. Mm -hmm. So that, that 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 was the those were the kind of details uh, that really sort of were the foundation of our project. And uh, he started exploring different kinds of like those more fantastical drawings building up from this vocabulary of uh material culture and that's when he sort of asked me whether i wanted to be part of it and like oh do you want to write for this and what could we write from this and then we talked about hey we i like lots of rpg books and you like lots of rpg books let's make let's make one of these like sort of gazetteers together. And because I was writing, or I was already writing sort of adventure modules and thinking about ways to design this kind of, these kinds of documents and make them useful for players. Uh, that's how we made our first few zines. Mm -hmm. uh, so it began with him sending me a brace of about 20 or 30 images. Uh, he was exploring cro crocodiles mm -hmm. and uh, a, a place or a region in, or a river kingdom which was ruled by crocodiles. So he sent me those images and like I looked at them and it, yeah, so ideas started flowing and we, we both created this, this, this kingdom that were in the sort of the stratification of society where crocodiles were at the top. Mm -hmm. and and people they were literally in, incarnated sort of divine beings and that was our first zine uh titled uh Merkur Gur. Mm -hmm. this is this is all background for the the project we are doing now which is rich of the roach cord which is our first book length uh work in this a thousand thousand islands project mm -hmm. and it is our first uh because all the zines previously have been more sure they're full of like characters and adventure hooks or and sort of uh game detail uh but this book will be our first which will contain sort of full full-fledged sort of adventures mm -hmm. uh that are interconnected and themed uh around caves uh, because Southeast Asia has a lot of very big sort of cave networks. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's a, it's three adventures. Uh, it will have an interlinked sort of interlinked tools for a full campaign. Uh, it details cultures on the ground and the main sort of so central figure that ties everything together and maybe may or may not be an antagonist is the is the reach uh, roach god of the title mm -hmm. now within the within the within the set within what i what i'm seeing um since you brought since you brought it up i would like to i would like to go into that go into that ca that um cave system since a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of um the people who are going to be listening to this are probably not going to be as familiar with the with those cave networks so sure. i'd like you i'd like you to describe what the what those are like because i'm i wouldn't i'm i'm guessing you i'm guessing you've made your own advent you've made your own adventures into some of those cave systems yourself um not as much as i like, like um so I mean that's the interesting thing about especially uh, 
there are certain quite well known sort of uh, cave, cave networks in in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Mulu sort of cave system uh, was largely explored in the nineteen seventies, but was well known for much earlier. Uh, and then there's there's a lot of cultural things uh, associated with caves. For example, uh, swiftlet nest cultivation, birds birds nest cultivation is uh, the sort of bird's nest soup that is very uh, is part of like Chinese culture. The bird's nest comes from Southeast Asia, yeah. uh, so there, there there is the idea like this har harvesting of bird's nest is, is 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 part of that. There's a lot of there. There are also a, a lot of our most of our prehistoric sort of uh, sites are located in sort of these kind of cave systems, mm -hmm. but. So as we were doing sort of our research into this, like uh, it, it, it was just a curious and sort of uh, evocative detail um, that one of the largest cave systems uh, in Vietnam, uh, the name the name of it escapes me at the moment, but I do remember that it was only discovered, like, because literally some some person who was uh, harvesting sort of forest produce stumbled across one of the entrances mm -hmm. it was only first uh documented in the in the 1990s mm -hmm. uh so yeah it's it is a geography of um where the sort of the, the sort of forests of the sort of uh at the equatorial forest uh makes it very hard to sort of uh enter sort of interior regions and because of this like massive massive sort of geographical formations are were unknown until pretty recently mm -hmm. uh I, that's that's just a very i don't know that 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 fires my imagination in yeah. it i i will admit that when i did when i did a bit of a search on um on cave systems in malaysia one of the one of the one of the big ones that kept that that kept show that kept showing up is the Batu caves. Oh right, uh, yeah, that one's that one's like uh, that one's really a fixture of a lot of our like like fixture of Malaysian cultural life really because uh, one of the largest uh, Hindu festivals uh, is centered around the temple that is located in the Batu caves. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a yeah you know I, I'm sure you've probably seen the photographs of those like hundreds of steps, uh, yeah. leading up to the sort of like temple. Yeah, I also I've also seen some footage when the uh, when the steps got uh, got a bit of a paint job. Oh yeah yeah they 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 are so like the last time I went, uh, there there there's like a really there's like a troop of like really nasty sort of like macaques uh so there's a monkey troop that lives as on the temple grounds and they are they're pretty like they're pretty rude because uh if you don't if you don't give them treats they'll reach into your bag bag and grab things uh, so yeah yeah it's it's a it's a it's an interesting i mean it's a it's a very striking sort of location really because uh the 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 sort of temple to murugan is located inside inside this 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 cave mm -hmm. uh and yeah it's a there is there is a definite sense of the sort of sacred um when you when you go up there uh, so yeah it's a like uh Sort of temples and shrines in caves is a, uh, I mean, it's pretty common. Mm -hmm. Now, within the within the within this particular um, this particular project, um, I ended, I've been, I've brought this kind of I brought this kind of thing up in the in the past, but do you have within the book? Do you have plans on putting a bit of a pronunciation guide for some of the? For some of the names, some of the terms, and and the like, so that when a GM is descri is describing what's what's being seen or describing some of the 
sayings that, in it, that NPCs might have that they're able to get it mostly on point. Since... Right. Um, so I, I show people like uh, different different people might have different approaches to this particular sort of issue. Like what what you're talking about basically is like, uh, and it often does come up. For example, because we've been making these zines for the last four years, really, um, one of the most common messages we get is that, "Hey, we'd really love your zines, but I, I'm, I, I'm really, I'm really afraid of running them because I've never been to Southeast Asia, I've never been to Malaysia or any of these countries. I might, I'm worried I'll get things wrong." So I understand, like, and of course, me and Mako understand the sort of like concern and uh the thing about that at least for me is that uh stuff like pronunciation uh, i personally would never include a glossary uh or a sort of pronunciation guide mm -hmm. in the sense that you know if you've never been to the region, uh, it's okay. Like, I'm ethnically Chinese, for for example, and I'm sure other people might have a problem with like, oh, white people sort of playing sort of orient like games set in like with sort of orientalist tropes, and they have like Chinese ninjas, for example. It. Um, it doesn't bother me because what people do at their table is, and I'm not saying that it's okay. It's just that I can't stop that anyway. So I'm not going to try to are educate you somebody. Over, are you crying over spilled milk? No, it's like, um, so I, the, the sort of big deal for us is like, uh, so a big thing for us in making the sort of conceptual framework of the zines is not to be representative of Southeast Asia in any way. Uh, when we write the zines and we make the zines and we craft these stories, these stories are ultimately centered on our sort of lived reality and our our own imagination. So for me and Mankau, it's important that we we keep that as the center as a, so the priority is to tell uh, the, the a truthful story about the things that we know mm -hmm. and the, the sort of imaginations that we we do know and we can sort of create from and then if people come in they come in you know it's a it's an invitational thing come sit at my table mm -hmm. uh if you need to, if you, if you need to know how to pronounce it, ask. Yeah. Uh, you, I both. I mean, I'm available on the internet, or you could Google these kind of things. You know, um, my priority is to tell a particular story, not be, uh, or to provide tools for telling a particular story, not to be hung up on legibility, which is what glossaries do. They they are they are designed to serve an audience that doesn't uh that doesn't want to google those terms themselves mm -hmm. i can uh, i can understand that and yeah. for me per, for me personally um i've um every, i've i have on my review series i've covered a handful of um a handful a handful of wuxia um, themed mm. games, right, um, right. Um, th things like Ogre Gate or Keen or um, ki or Kill the Buddha, um, and inevitably, I end up getting somebody who gets on me about my pronunciation. Instead of they go, i.e., they go through a ten or twenty minute video where I go where I go over the rules of a certain game, and the focus is how I is how I pronounced key. <laughs> for instance, I um, mean, for like so, uh, an an interesting sort of like related sort of anecdote 
for me is that uh, I didn't know what to, or or I I pronounce it interchangeably, Wuxia and Wuxia, because the thing is, even though I am literally ethnically Chinese, I don't have a, a, a personal sort of relationship with the genre at least not in its not in its mandarin language or uh english language variants so oh. it's a it's a pronunciation that i have the i have trouble with so i think that everybody uh like people people everywhere have issues with uh pronunciation and the like i don't know i think it's rich that I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I can. I can safely. I can safely say that I know plenty of native speakers who keep screwing up my. Who keep screwing up my name. So. Um, yeah. So the. So yeah. it is. It is not. It is not a cross language issue. It's more. It's more of a issue of people being people. But. I do remember. I do remember. I do remember when someone. When so. When someone br when someone brought up the whole th that whole thing of of um of pe of people of people playing um char characters in a in a culture that they've never been in, and I remember immediately saying, "I I've n I'm ru I'm I'm running st I'm running a stalker game and I've never and I've never been in I've never been in Russia." Um, right. Right. Um. I don't. I've I've argued that I've argued that one of the reasons The Witcher ended up getting so popular is because it presented a fantasy that wasn't, um, that what that wasn't Western Europe. Um, for sure, for sure. The, the um, the yeah, one of the one of the Emmy Award winners this year, um, for set for settings, was Brand Colonia, which is describes itself as a back to front medieval um Italy, medieval Italy. Right, um, right. I I ended up getting that, and I I loved it. I've I've run a, I've run a couple of campaigns in it. I've never mm -hmm. set foot in Italy. Um, sure. But when I spoke with the developer of it, I got I got a bit of a crash course on certain aspects of Italian pop culture, and I I found it I found it kind of fascinating. So I yeah, ended up dig, yeah. I ended up digging through more. the The sole reason the sole reason that I end up I ended up um. I I and I wanted to do these kind of interviews is because it's it's a place it's it's a place or a th or a thing that um that is that is a new experience and I like sure. new experiences. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, and I mean I well as 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 a person mm -hmm. also I mean I like new experiences too. So that's so that the I mean the, this 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 whole thing sort of. Um, implicates a, a wider conversation about what appropriation for example is uh and the thing about it is that it it, it frustrates me that the, the the conversation around sort of representation and or sort of cultural appropriation is focused on um the sort of uh the wrapping around it i mean the, the superficiality of like who is pronouncing what, and which actors get to to portray which roles? There's the the there's a, or or, or what to... kind of illustrations are in in allowed in books? When I mean appropriation is about power, and who owns the economic power that is uh, that these cult that that using this culture profits. Uh, so mm -hmm. my, the, my big example is that it really doesn't matter how many, uh, non-white figures you put into a Dungeons and Dragons source book, uh, illustrations, if your editorial sort of, uh, list is still all white people. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the, that's when we talk about this sort of like a uh, thing, it's. It, it's all the it's the material condition side of it that's that's the important bit for me uh, um i i i remember i 
there's a there's a couple of music examples I I always I always find myself getting drawn to whenever when it comes to this particular debate. Um, that being Skiltron and Whispered. Um, so I'm quite a music nerd. Um, Skiltron, it is a pagan leaning folk metal group. Um, that focuses a lot that fo that focuses a lot on the stories and legends of Scotland. Right. The band themselves is from Argentina. Sure. Um, Whispered is a melodic death metal band that is heavily themed around samurai. Their first album, Thousand Swords, was all, was all about Musashi Bo Benke from the Tale of Genji. The man, the man obsessed with collecting a thousand swords from a thousand duels, sure, and sure. They're, they're from Finland, which has the largest per capita amount of amount of metal bands in the entire world. And in both in both cases, they cl they clearly have a they clearly have a respect for the for the cultures that they're singing about and they and they perf and they perform they performed in the in those countries as well um skiltron has performed a at vakken which is the ho which is the holy grail of open of open air um festivals when it comes to metal and um whispered has toured japan many times right. and the 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 question that I keep that I keep asking when it comes to when it comes to the appropriation debate is could you re could you really go, could you really walk up to either of those bands and tell them what you're what you're doing is wrong you need to change it well it, and another music example is the Wu Tang Clan has never been shy about uh it's it's the the sort of obsessions of its members. I mean, like they, they they're so heavily inspired by uh, Hong Kong cinema and sort oh, yeah. of like uh, martial arts cinema, for example. Mm -hmm. the, and the th the thing about the thing about this thing is that at least where I stand on it, it's like you can make whatever you want. Uh, oh, yeah. And but, but also it is also true. Like and this is a. I believe this is what Ursula Le Guin uh, said: is that you will, part of the part of artistic practice is is that anybody who is work, making making work about a culture that is not their own is always subject to the criticisms of the of that particular culture. So it's like it's not like you can't make it, but uh, you are not automatically. Uh, absolved from responsibility when you do make it, uh, which I think it's a it's a very it's a very good sort of principle in the sense that, uh, and that's a kind of thing I would I would also tr I uh, we also try to embody when we make these scenes is that yeah. these scenes are for your table. Like I don't know who your players are, they may have never met a person from Southeast Asia, and that's fine. Like I don't need. To make sure that you at your table are hundred uh, percent authentic to make me sleep at night, but it is it is an issue and it is a problem when, um, oh. for example, uh, an American publisher uh, makes a book about Southeast Asia and market it, markets it as a and as an authority. I think that can be. If if that's the marketing, I think we then then it deserves a sort of critical examination of whether or not that's true. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a it's a case by case thing, and it yeah. is a. But for for me, I um, I just I just want I just want people to play more things. <laughs> um, for sure. For sure. And yeah, I think I think uh, so. Like I know I know that there, there are certain aspects of this conversation that that frustrate me personally, and I oftentimes find myself sounding both way more permissible than any any anybody else on the internet, and also way more hardline than anybody else. I've um, um 
I've had I've had to deal with, I've had to deal with purists in one form or another ever since I ever since I started GMing. So I tr so I try and not follow suit on that on that kind of mindset. Sure, sure. Um, and and that's uh that for at least for Mankao and I that uh, not getting stun locked into that sort of conversation is is the only way we can make work because at the end of the day it's not about how we are representing ourselves to an outside culture it's about are we making something that is true for ourselves yeah um so it's Marco and i always style it as a it's not about we are not making a work that's representational mm -hmm. we are making works that are a recentering uh because the trouble with uh fantasy like popular fantasy fiction for example is the the center of the imagination like like you alluded to earlier is uh anglo-european sort of euro fantasy you know like the, the tolkien-esque imagination I, I call it the tolkien melting pot yeah yeah uh which is which in in terms of dungeons and dragons and rpgs it is really a, a gigantian melting pot because the the assumptions of that in dungeons and dragons are very particular to a kind of uh Amer american exceptionalism so it's a it's a it's a it's an American uh, abridgment of what uh, people in America might think uh, European fantasy is, because Dungeons and Dragons has a lot of quirks. Uh, but one thing that it does do is like sort of uh, uh, flatten a lot of the weirdness that's intrinsic in a lot of like uh, European fantasy, for example. Um, yeah, so, uh, and it's, a uh, how do we make fantasy weird? And the answer to that is always make it very specific. Uh, so like we are doing for the zines, uh, I bring up Patrick again, Patrick Stewart again, because I, I, because he, his work is also a very great example. He wrote the book called Silent Titans, mm -hmm. which is a sort of campaign setting book uh, that is set in a sort of psychedelic um, uh, Britain, mm -hmm. but a specific part of Britain. So it is uh, Bir specifically Birkenhead or the Viral Peninsula, where he is actually from, in which he grew up, grows up, grew up in. So the, the, the book itself has adventures and sort of creatures and, 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 and landscapes that are very, very, like they are riffs of sort of local sort of folklore that I definitely don't get. Like mm -hmm. if I didn't read his blog, I wouldn't know that, you know, the, the sort of like painted boats of this particular section of the adventure are, 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 are were inspired by a real thing in the in sort of the harbor of his hometown, uh, but because that's where the inspiration for the fantasy comes, it is refreshing. And I mean, there's nowhere that's more over, supposedly overexposed than sort of the English countryside fantasy. Mm -hmm. But because it's so specific, it is so fresh. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Now. When it comes to the when it comes to the the advent the um, starter adventures that you're put that you're putting in there, um, mm. obviously we can't go into we can't go into exhaustive detail with each. But would it be a, would it be fair of me to say that that all three of them is a themed sandbox? I I guess um, I've never I've never run I've never written because I've never run a sort of like a adventure path, if you see it. So uh, they are all kind of like, here's a place or here's a community, here's a cast of, and, and these are particular creatures or, or pe people slash creatures, because often in, oftentimes in the Thousand Thousand Islands, uh, animals are, are a few full characters. Um, these are the characters who live here, uh, this this is what they want. This is how they might relate to each other. This is a this is a geographical feature in 
in terms of region of the roach god is they are often sort of caves uh and yeah you know like what do you do you you're here i mean the the sort of preview pdf adventure that we posted as part of the campaign which is one of the three camp three three adventures begins by you arriving at a tea house and like the the villagers are scared because they've seen like flying shapes in the night i mean it's it's a fairly sort of typical start uh you all and, meet yeah, in the so... tavern <laughs> you all meet in the tavern kinda, you just replace basically, the basically. tavern with tea house uh and um yeah what do you do what 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 do you want to do next mm -hmm. um and with with that with that in with that in mind the th within the within each of within each of them i had no i had noticed um i had noticed certain certain parts of the text were bolded um right is it is it a case where the where you where you wanted the, where you wanted those to be the key parts of that of that particular passage? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I was I was generally building things because I I mean like it's easier to pick out when you're you when you need to reference uh, a document like that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know that. that and already, already because it's system agnostic, you're going to have to do notes. That's also why, in the layout of our zines and and this adventure, uh, there's so much, uh, so so much negative space or white space in the layout, it's because it's meant to be used. Uh, uh, sort of GM is meant to be writing notes, and players are meant to be writing notes, and uh, yeah. All right. Now, one, one of, now I will, I will, I will admit, um, in a lot, in a lot of, um, in a lot of OSR like des like designs, there's a tendency to, to um, to allow for presenting what's that, presenting what's inside a given book and letting the table make it their own in in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Is that is that kind of thing is that kind of thing present? Obviously, it's a bit easier to do that when you're system agnostic. Yeah, I mean, so like we've always, uh, so the zines have ne have always been system neutral, and that's because, uh, I mean, for one, Manko and I don't really are not great at designing sort of uh, rule sets. Uh, we're fairly okay at sort of like making adventures, if you will, sort of like uh, mm -hmm. who's here. The random tables are all designed, to, are written in such a way to, that it always keeps in mind uh, who, like what, if player characters encounter this particular thing, will they or won't they uh, be interested in interacting with them? So they always sort of tweak towards, yeah, you know, like this particular trade good or this particular person who has who is selling this particular thing. You would want to interact with them uh, mm -hmm. for what for various reasons. Um, so yeah, because the because the texts and the images are all geared towards uh, creating uh, situations that are pregnant. Uh, I guess is the is the most useful way to describe it. Um, just in terms of what I've known, like people get back to us about how they how we've used uh, how they've used uh, our zines, and yeah, like folks have run it in straight D uh, straight fifth edition D and D. Folks have run it in a host of retro clones. Uh, a large uh, one of the first people to ever that I know to ever play a game in the zines used it uh, in conjunction with like uh, Fall of Magic, uh, and has gone on to play use a different sort of storytelling rule set for every zine we've ever put out, um, which I find is a fascinating approach. Uh, yeah, I mean like. The, the the thing that su personally surprises me is that people have 
sat down with no prep whatsoever, opened the zine and just run from the zine, which is uh, I didn't expect. Because even I assumed that you know you know you need to do a little bit of uh, preparation uh, to make it suit your campaign or your table. Uh, but I guess that's that's possible. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think making it system agnostic is really a really fecund way to make a game. Mm-hmm. And what are you sh- what are you shooting for as far as the total page count of reach? Uh wow, God, I need to look at my notes because uh, the the thing about the book is that we are we are still writing it and creating it. So this this campaign is really one of this. We are we are using Kickstarter as it is literally advertised in that. We need to raise funds so that we can work on this for the next year. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I think it's about three hundred plus pages at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really depends on whether or not, uh, like one of our next stretch goals is a beast theory, which may extend the book a little bit. <laughs> uh, so yeah. For the time being, it's about 300 plus pages. Yeah. And I'm, gu- I'm guessing th- I'm guessing that the PDF version is going to be properly bookmarked. I know that's some, yeah. that seems obvious, but I have seen some cases where some, where some folks forget, forget that. And then, not, and then I have to, I have to rail on them about it because I, um, I believe in true equality, which means nobody gets special treatment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, that annoys me too because I hate working in PDFs and uh, if if there are no bookmarks in the PDF, it just makes it that much harder to refer to. So yeah, uh, we've always put bookmarks in our zines yeah. and I don't think it'll be any different. And for me personally, it's a, it's an instance of I'm, I'm big on navigation. Um, mm-hmm. In the same in the same vein that when someone's designing a website, you want you want them to know exactly where they need to go to to get what they want to get. Sure. And if you put any obstacles in front of them, that's a failure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the it's the reason why I say Rifts was my, has been my whipping boy for twenty years because um, so much of so much of the navigation in those in those books is full of lies. Right. Okay. Uh, I've ne- I I I I I have not looked at riffs. I have to confess. Um, I like riffs as a setting. I just don't like running it with its co- with its base rules. Okay. Yeah. I that that happens a lot, eh? Because uh, I know I I do have a soft spot for Shadowrun, but the uh, the system is just obtuse to me. You. You might have an easier time with sixth edition when it comes to Shadowrun, but I will admit even even I have ish, even I have issues with some of its some of its choice some of its choices. Um, but when but um for what for some for some reason maybe it's because of the emphasis on roaches and and um the and the way people look at um look at insects but i always but i ended up getting a bit of a vibe that you that one could easily lean more into into fa- into fairy tale horror with some, right. with some of the with some of the adventures with reach of the roach god is is that something that you guys planned for or is that something that i just conjured up by accident no i think it's it definitely mirrors some of the genre tropes uh, the thing I, the thing I'd say in response to that is uh, uh, people have people have often said this about our previous scenes as well uh, that they often that they may be uh, they they do have a horror tone maybe or they do have a fairy tale like air. I think um, those those categories 
uh, make make a lot of sense for like uh, stories that arise from a sort of Western tradition. But uh, when so the the, the the sort of stories that we we are inspired by or are modeling our, our zines from don't really have a distinction between oh this is horror or this is a fairy tale or this is fairy tale horror. It's uh, um, in the same way that a lot of uh, a lot of the it, it's true that a king may be a divine god and also a spirit of a place and also an animal in Southeast Asia. You know, like a, what is a tiger but a person because they're often shape changing, uh, but also a spirit of a of a of a of a of a particular forest, but also an animal that you that that is that is wild and might might eat you. So the distinctions between those categories or those taxonomies are are fluid. So when it comes to Reach of the Roche God, just like our previous zines, it's like the bug like yeah, so you meet roaches in the stuff the Stata adventure, for example. They're kind of mean. Uh they're kind of, they are to me they're very disgusting because I have a full full the approaches. But they are also written as characters. And the antagon the supposed antagonist of that particular adventure may seem villainous, but it's mainly but it's not it's not a big bad evil guy that you have to defeat at the end of the adventure. Mm -hmm. There are many ways you could play that or as a GM and in the main ways to interact with them as a kid, with, with them as a character. One of the big things for that particular character is that uh, she's a refugee from her father and she's looking for a different way to exist. Uh, the, the roaches of the, of the, of the book are belong to a culture that are that is that is pretty uh, ruthless and uh, uh, cruel, uh, but she genuinely wants to fi figure out a different way to relate to her, her sort of brood, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, like it's I can see how it's a fairy tale, uh, and I can see how it's hard. Yeah, but uh, it's 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 best, or at least I. I have to view it as neither of those things or all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I specifically use the wording, the wording that I did because I've, um, I've, I may have, I have a bit, I, I've always, I've always, enjo I've always enjoyed when, um, when somebody, when somebody grows up on the, on the lighter end of, um, fairy tales or or folk tales, and then and then they read the act, then they read the actual fairy tales, and, the, and then they, and realize how messed up they were. Um, right, right. Some some region some regions more than others. Um, yeah, that, that 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 definitely is a sort of Victorian sort of period and sort of sanitization of the Western sort of fairy tales. Yeah, and then um, you realize later that you know you know it's pretty bad that. Uh, such and such person is baking her her stepchildren or whatever. Mm -hmm. oh. a lot of a lot of them in a lot of the a lot of the really screwed up ones in in Europe end up coming from Germany of all places. Kind of weird. Oh. But then then again um then again cer certain forests in Eastern Europe were dangerous enough as it was. So I see it as just a reflection of that in the in the same way that being being out in the wilderness, well, anywhere in in antiquity, um, depend if you weren't properly prepared, was a death wish. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and yeah. imagination will do interesting things, <laughs> but what do you? I know you had I know you had put in a bit a bit of a thing, but um. What are you shoot? What are you shooting for as far as a release window? So the book is slated, so we are fairly confident we can have it out by October twenty twenty two. So Just that's the... our cutoff date. Yeah. Um. 
So it's it is it is a year from now essentially. Yeah, just in just in t just in time for uh just in time for All Hallows Eve. Oh right, yeah, mm, I I didn't I I honestly didn't think about that, but yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, but I think because of shipping, it'll probably be it'll probably be later than that. Because yeah, uh, we are I we are printing it here, so I fig I figured that I figured that was going to be a factor. I was mainly asking in so far as the PDF version. Right, right, right. But I'll I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 all kinds of anxious about it too. So. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Uh, thanks for having me. I mean, you reached out, and you know, it's it's good to uh, yeah, it's good to it's good to connect. Mm -hmm. So and. Anytime you see fit to return to my temple, the door the door is always open. As I often say sure. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!